Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my second time filming this video because the entire first take was blurry. Hi YouTube, it's Kathy, and this is my weekly entertainment wrap-up for March 19th through 25th. This week I read two books, I watched two shows, I watched two movies, I listened to one audiobook, and I listened to one complete podcast. This has never actually happened to me before. I use a camera that has autofocus and I don't have a screen so I can't see what's being filmed. So hopefully in this second take, it is not blurry because I will be so mad. This is my weekly entertainment wrap up for February 19th through 25th. This week I read two books, I watched two shows, I watched two movies, I listened to one audiobook, and I listened to one podcast, which has not happened for years. Also, as I mentioned the first time I filmed this, I'm in my parents' house, but I'm in my parents' house for the last time for at least three months because this time next week I will be in England. Chad and I are going on a three month trip around Europe, and I'm very excited to take you with us and hopefully get some non blurry footage of the whole trip for you and make some travel vlogs. That's going to be fun. First this week I read a short story collection called Let Your Lips Twitch. This just wasn't for me. There were several aspects of different stories in this that were either sexist or fatphobic or heteronormative or things that I just don't generally enjoy, but I feel I did a disservice by not writing down these instances so I could actually tell you about all of them and back up what I'm saying because I don't want to make a claim where something happened, such as something being sexist. I can't think of exactly when that happened, but I get this feeling from remembering reading this. At a point I just kind of tried to finish the stories and didn't really take many notes on them because I knew I wasn't going to give this a positive review, so I didn't really want to dwell in how uncomfortable some of the scenes were making me. Nothing was incredibly egregious, it just had this like thin layer of all of these things I don't really enjoy, so it might be for you, it just wasn't for me. There was definitely one story that I particularly thought was creative where all of the characters in the story were self-help books in this library just waiting to be checked out by their patrons. Entrance, and I thought that was kind of creative and interesting. Essentially this book is supposed to make your lips twitch. In fact that phrase seems to come up in pretty much every short story. And an introduction from the author is trying to say that it's basically telling you that you have permission to laugh, you have permission to be amused by things. And that's all well and good, but when the things that we're supposed to be amused by are ableist or fatphobic or heteronormative or those types of things, those aren't the things that I'm generally amused by. I feel like the camera is tilted right now and honestly there's nothing I'm going to be able to do about it. The other book I read this week was recommended by Rachel from Reads with Rachel on her graphic novel recommendations. This was an honorary mention because it's not actually a graphic novel, it just has a lot of pictures, and it's called The Power of Style. This is a nonfiction book written for teens about different cultures and the different styles within those different cultures, what they mean, where they came from, how people are using them now, and it also talks a little bit about appreciation versus appropriation. I thought this was really well written, I learned a few things, and I can appreciate it even though I'm really a jeans and a t-shirt girl because I don't know how to dress myself. One of the shows I watched this week, the first one being all seven episodes of The Watcher. This is a Netflix show that is based on a true crime, except for it is very, very loosely based on that true crime. If you're going into this looking for all of the details of what actually happened at that house, you will not find them. There are a few of them sprinkled in here, but this is definitely a dramatization. If you're not familiar with this case, there was this family that bought this dream house of theirs. They were excited to move into it, but they needed to do a couple of renovations first. And as those renovations were happening, they started getting these creepy letters from somebody who signed them, The Watcher. It was somebody who was assigned to watch their house and also at some points figured out what their kids' names were and kept asking for young blood. And the letters got so creepy that these people didn't end up actually living in the house. However, in this adaptation, they do live in the house, creepy things happen, and it goes from there. Also, interestingly, there's another true crime story that they've taken from elsewhere and just kind of put in here as a potential who could be doing it type of thing, and I found that really fascinating because I had heard about that true crime before, so when certain details started coming up, I was like, wait a second, that has nothing to do with this case. It had to do with this completely other case. Cool. If you know about this case and can suspend the fact that you know details that are not going to be the right details, I definitely recommend this. If you're just looking for something kind of creepy to watch, I recommend this. This is a case that continues to be unsolved to this day. So as an adaptation of a concept of what happened, I really enjoyed this. As soon as I realized that it wasn't going to be true to what actually happened, I just fell into the storytelling of it and I had a really good time. Similarly, Chad and I continued to watch Only Murders in the Building. This is a show that 
centers these three people that live in the same New York apartment building. There's a murder there. All three of them are very much into the same true crime podcast and they decide they're going to start their own podcast about this murder so they can solve who did it. There are lots of twists and turns in this one and I did not see who the killer was coming until we got to the very end. When Chad and I started this, we kind of got all the way through episode 5, although he fell asleep in episode 5, and then we forgot to pick it back up until now. So we rewatched episode 5, finished that entire season, and then got three episodes into the second season, which has a lot of comedy around the fact that true crime podcasts, when they do a second season, they're not usually as popular because it's a completely different case and all that type of thing, which this one does have a completely different case. So I enjoyed that little nod to the culture of people who consume true crime content. I'm also really interested to see who did this crime, which we saw foreshadowed in the first season. There are a lot of points in this that make me laugh out loud. I think the writing is really, really clever, and I'm looking forward to seeing how this season ends. Hopefully we will do so pretty quickly, because like I said before, we're leaving the country and I'm pretty sure we'll have access to this streaming platform while we're away, but I would just like to have it finished so that I know I'm not going to be on a cliffhanger for three months. On the movies we watched this week first, because Megan and I had not seen Pretty Woman before, we decided to watch that. Because this is an iconic film and it is from 1990, we had heard a few things that happened in this, but it was actually interesting to watch it in its entirety. Also, we saw the movie poster for it, and Richard Gere has black hair in that movie poster, and that was really concerning because that's not the hair that he should ever have, and he doesn't have that hair in this movie, so that was really weird and interesting and of note. This is probably not the best representation of sex work, but the basic premise of this movie is Richard Gere is in town for a week and he just needs some companionship. He hires somebody off the street and decides to just have her stay with him for a week. Shenanigans ensue. It has its ups and downs. It's a romantic comedy. You will understand what's going to happen in the end. For the movie it was trying to be, I think it did a good job. Then, because apparently we could only watch movies that have the word woman in the title, we also watched The Woman King. Megan had seen this before, I hadn't, but it's Viola Davis, so I knew I was going to watch it. This one takes place in, I believe, 1838, and it's about this group of women warriors who are protecting their nation and protecting their king, and that is just badass, and I knew I was going to watch it for the badassery. There are also elements of the plot that I saw coming, but I think that the director or the studio or whatever wanted you to see these things coming, so I don't feel overly smug about that and, or overly upset that I saw things coming. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but I believe this is based around true events, so if it is and you have any good resources about those true events, please let me know down in the comments below because I would love to read up on it or watch a documentary or anything like that. I didn't have coffee the first time. I feel like I'm talking faster mostly because I want to get this done again and I'm really, really hoping that the autofocus it's working this time. The audiobook I listened to this week was very short. It was about three and a half minutes and I actually watched it on YouTube and that is I Am Jazz. This is actually a picture book and the video I watched was Jazz and her family reading different sections of this picture book and showing you the story and I thought that was absolutely adorable. It was done for a literacy campaign and I thought that was great. This is the story of Jazz who is a transgender teenager, although she might be in her early 20s by now. I don't know. I don't follow her. I know she's very popular but I don't know much about her. In any case, this is her story about growing up and realizing at a very young age that she is trans and what that looks like for her. And it is a picture book and it is for children. One thing to note, especially from the trans reviewers whose reviews I have checked in on, this is a trans person's story, but it's not all trans people's stories. This book could have been made even better by including more trans people in the narrative. Just because, yes, her story is valid, but that won't be every trans person's story. It's nice to have other stories out there as well. However, it is her story so you can't fault her for telling her story. Believe it or not, I finally got around to reading this because of Floss Tube. If you're not aware of Floss Tube, it's where the cross stitchers hang out on YouTube. And there's a creator called D's 20 Stitches and they created something called Stitch for Pride, where you have this spreadsheet of different pride related things that you need to do before you complete a cross stitch prompt and you do this throughout the year. This was one of the things on that list and I'm glad that I finally got around to it. I counted it as my audiobook for the week because I did not finish a long 
longer audiobook for this week. And honestly, since I started listening to audiobooks, I haven't skipped an audiobook in a week, so I was counting this. As for the podcasts I listened to this week, I listened to all eight episodes of The Coldest Case in Laramie. I haven't talked about a podcast on here for what seems like years, but I listened to this one all in one day and I had to tell you about it, especially because the audiobook I listened to this week was very short, but I didn't finish the longer one that I'm currently working on, so here we are. If you've heard of Laramie before, it's probably because you've heard of the case of Matthew Shepard, which is a solved case, an incredibly sad case, and a case I was actually made aware of in my teens because there's a play called The Laramie project about what happened in that case and the devastation it caused to the community. The author of this podcast actually grew up in Laramie and in her early teens and in the early 80s there was a murder that happened that really stuck with her and over the years she's found herself googling the name and trying to figure out if anything has come of that case until recently she found out that somebody was actually arrested for it but even though they were charged they were let go and they haven't been recharged since and when she looked into this it was somebody who used to be law enforcement, so that kind of perked up her ears. So she decided to reach out to the family to kind of figure out what they were thinking about this. And then she tried to figure out why it never went to court and who could have done it. And let me just tell you, this was an absolutely interesting ride. Firstly, we have this person coming in who's unbiased, talking to the family, trying to figure out exactly who they think did it. They are very adamant about who did it, but they haven't seen justice for it. And then she actually went through all of these reports and all of these police interviews, and then came to realize that memory is incredible incredibly fallible and um, that's all I'm going to say. The only hook I saw from this is that the police think they know who did it but they'll probably never be charged and I was like okay I want to see what went down with this case and it's really fascinating. I listened to this entire podcast in one day so that is definitely doable. The episodes are between 20 and 35 minutes and I just sat there cross-stitching, listening, hearing all of these different interviews, hearing all the things that people remember from back then, and then hearing the evidence that was found by this investigative journalist. And let me tell you, it was a wild ride. If you're into true crime or you're into podcasts or you're into true crime podcasts, I definitely recommend this one. That's it for this week. If you've read, watched, or listened to any of these, let me know about it down in the comments below. On the way down to the comments, if you hit that subscribe button, that would be very nice of you. If you don't feel like leaving a comment, but want to make sure that I know you were here, just leave me an emoji or a smiley face if you happen to be on your keyboard. Some people have asked if there's a way to financially support this channel, so I set up a coffee account, which is a digital tipping service. The link for that, as always, is down below. You can like and share this as you see fit, and I will see you very soon. Bye! Please be in focus.